Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Sammons, uh, one of the managing directors of the forum, and uh, it's my real privilege to have you join us here at the beginning of the afternoon, but the end of uh, three remarkable days, to have a bit of a reflection together uh, about uh, how China will be shaping an innovative society in the fourth industrial revolution uh, going forward. We have a, a terrific uh, panel with us to help with those reflections. Um, Chen Lei is on my immediate left, and uh, he has been really quite an instrumental figure as the chief executive officer of Zun Lei from here in the People's Republic of uh, China at uh, playing an important role uh, first through your work in computer science at Tsinghua, but also as the former co-chief executive officer and chief technology officer uh, of the firm that you're now engaged with uh, in helping to think through and drive business value in that important segment of the fourth industrial revolution. In addition, we're joined by Hua Fong Te, who is from Singapore. He's a group chief financial officer and chairman for Greater China of One Championship also has the distinction, which is particularly important for us in the form of being a young global leader. Uh, and he's had quite a diverse set of experiences across the public uh, and private sectors uh, over the years uh, in Singapore, including uh, in the military, uh, where he was with the Air Force. And I'm sure you'll bring some of that experience out when you talk about your reflections on today's uh, discussions. Uh, on his immediate right, Professor uh, Stuart Russell, who I think is quite simply can be said one of the leading lights in the world on artificial intelligence. And we're very pleased uh, to have you with us uh, this morning and here uh, this week. And finally, uh, Zhang Lu, uh, who's an entrepreneur and technologist. She founded a medical device company earlier uh, in her career that created a non-invasive uh, breath analyzer test for type 2 diabetes. But uh, more recently, she's been a driving force at Fusion Fund, a venture capital firm focusing on early stage technology investment and acting a bit as a bridge, if I understand it correctly, between the Chinese and uh, North American and more generally international uh, communities uh, focused on uh, VC and early stage uh, ventures. Just a word or two to set the, the frame for the discussion uh, here. China has made uh, enormous progress. There's been an enormous transformation over the last dozen or years uh, that the forum has been holding its annual meeting of the new champions here. Uh, if you think about it, and if my colleagues think about it who are, who are here with us today, when we started, uh, the GDP per capita in this country was uh, about half of what it is today. It's an absolutely remarkable uh, transformation. Hundreds of millions of, of, uh, of people have been lifted out of poverty over the last uh, 15, 20 uh, years. And uh, one of the, I think, true distinctions about China's approach to development has been the human-centered uh, focus of it. it. Takes a very, very specific form, and that is that the, this society, this government, places employment, employment creation, really at the very top of the hierarchy of considerations in the way it thinks about organizing development. 13 million plus jobs alone were created in this country uh, last year. But as we've been hearing here this week, there's a big forward uh, focus on the part of the Chinese uh, leadership in the public and private sectors on uh, increasing the innovation in the economy, moving up the value-added value curve, if you will, in industrial development. And that means, by definition, improving productivity, bringing more automation and innovation to bear. And in principle, that can create a potential tension with employment creation. One of the most important topics this week has been the discussion about the future of work and how countries reconcile this drive to harness technology, to improve productivity uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, do what the Chinese leadership has done for so many years so successfully, and that is ensure very robust employment generation and rising GDP per capita, which has doubled every 10 or 12 years for the last generation or so in this country, an absolutely remarkable question. So it's this tension, I think, that lies at the heart of the frame of today's conversation about shaping 
uh, a, an innovative society here in China going forward. And I would simply like to invite uh, our panelists, uh, starting with you, uh, Mr. Chen Lei, uh, to just reflect a little bit. How do you think, the, what, what might be some of the most important ways, important considerations for how the country thinks about having a successful reconciliation of uh, harnessing that innovation but maintaining that employment intensive focus going forward? Technological development, automation, and its relations with employment, I don't think there's much conflict. For China, we emphasize, we emphasize education a lot. The educational level of the Chinese people is growing up progressively. If you look at enrolled uh, undergraduate, masters, PhD students, and graduates, the numbers are all going up. So uh, in terms of overcoming the challenges of te technological innovation, I think China will be doing fine. And for the Chinese people, individually speaking, we all emphasize education a lot. So our investment in education is huge. At the same time, automation, when we talk about it, it's not a only thing uh, in the fourth industrial revolution we need to look at. Now, as we push forward the fourth industrial revolutions, there will be new industries, new opportunities. And more importantly, we need to think about what do we do to make to urbanize the rural population and to increase their educational level so that China as a whole on the uh, fundamental levels for example uh, blockchain uh, big data uh, China can develop on these areas so that the whole society can move forward For me, I've been focusing on advanced technology. The investment of advanced technology, one of these is industrial IoT, uh, computing power, and automation. When I'm looking at these things, when you're talking about application, one important factor is how to converge technology with traditional uh, industries, and in this, Many people um, and uh, think may, uh, pe people misunderstand uh, the tension between technology and traditional sectors. We talk about this theme for this year. This word "revolution" um, is the key word, but it is really a revolution or a evolution. If it is not revolution, it is evolution. Then, for industry, in the, uh, traditional industries, maybe they will be more open, more friendly to new technologies. And if you look at new new uh, technologies. They are there because they want to increase the efficiency of the workforce, but they are not uh, there to replace all uh, the uh, human beings. Or the uh, It is not that all the factories will over the night be 100% automated. Their way of production will not be altered or changed 100%. So when I'm talking uh, with the high-tech startups, I often tell them that this is a high-tech product but if you want it to be uh, embraced in this new round of fourth industrial revolution, you need to think about the application, the cost of application or integration into the existing model. Is it possible that the existing way of doing things, uh, uh, they can incorporate your new products into the way they do? Then you'll get uh, be successful. Um, so I think of it a different way. I, I think um, I accept the analysis of economists like Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee that automation has already uh, led to a significant reduction in employment prospects for most people in Western countries uh, and has led to the hollowing out of the middle class um, and a greater shift of, of uh, income from labor to capital, uh, which is continuing and accelerating. Um, and people always say, well, you know, we've had this technological unemployment talk for, for centuries and, uh, you know, we had these revolutions before and, you know, people used to work on the farms and now they don't, but they still have jobs. So the same thing is going to happen again. Um, well, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way to think about it is, look, we've basically made physical labor impossible to sell. So if all you have to sell is your body, 
uh, you can't sell it anymore. We are in the process of making mental labor impossible to sell. So if all you have to sell is mental labor, there's going to be no market for it. Um, so, okay, where are the other, you know, two billion jobs going to come from if they're not physical and they're not mental? Right? I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, and in the short term, absolutely, I think China's policy is right, that they're educating lots and lots of engineers uh, and computer scientists. They have very good mathematical training, which is uh, essential for this, and I think some other countries uh, are not doing as well in that dimension. But in the long term, um, you know, even data scientists are going to be uh, replaced. Yeah. Uh, and we don't need two billion data scientists anyway. So um, what do we have left? I think it's the fact that we are human beings. So I foresee a very different economy in 30 to 50 years time from the one we're going to see over the next decade. Uh, an economy where most people are engaged in providing human to human services, services that can enhance the quality of life uh, very significantly. And this is not a, a dystopian view at all. Right? We've been using the human race as robots since the beginning of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Um, and now that's coming to an end because we're going to have real robots. Uh, so we have to prepare for that transition, uh, and that requires a complete shift in our education system, right? We've got to train people to be better human beings uh, in our science base, right? Our science base is not going to be oriented around producing physical objects. Uh, it's going to be oriented around how human beings can improve each other's lives. In some sense, the thing that we really care about, we hope that the physical objects would improve people's lives, and to some extent they have, and in other dimensions they haven't. Um, and so I think if China grasps that opportunity, um, because of the, the rate at which China can change uh, its system, uh, it might be the the shining example of a post-robot society where humans are not being used as robots anymore. Can, can I ask just uh, our colleagues here who live in the, in, the, in the People's Republic of China, how does that analysis connect with your own thinking in this regard? China has had a big emphasis on industrial employment creation in, in particular. Uh, but as to the professor's point, the society is rapidly aging where there'll be an increased demand for these kinds of human services. Do you think that <coughs> that will create uh, likely the kind of opportunity that's necessary to maintain full employment? I think aging society indeed creates tremendous uh, employment opportunities now we have many innovations and innovative projects for the aging society, uh, which are developing very fast. And we have a lot of uh, projects like this in China. And I don't think this is the only way for creating new jobs, but I agree with the professor. We do have a lot of uh, services, and the service sector in the future will be reshaped and will create more jobs. And I think from, I can give you one example. I live in Shenzhen city. And over the past decade, of the past 10 to 15 years, the industry structure of Shenzhen has undergone profound changes. At early days, Shenzhen is more about a light industry like clothing, uh, electronics, and parts and components. These are the core industries of Shenzhen in the past. And nowadays, the city has been turned into a high technology driven city. The high technology has been, in, uh, the percentage of the uh, high technology in the local GDP has been increasing year after year. I believe. The world in the future will embrace more automation. Human will not be turned into machines. However, in the manufacturing sector, we can still create a lot of innovative 
post uh, innovative positions and jobs which may need the creativity of human beings in order to do better. So in agriculture and in industries, in fundamental industries, I think there will still be job opportunities for humans. And now our economy is a closed loop economy driven by consumption and production. So if there's no human in the production system, how could you drive the development of the consumption economy? And how could you purchase the product? So if all the world factories were operated by robots without creating income for humans, then who will purchase the product? This is also a very interesting social issue. In fact, I've invested a lot of companies doing uh, AI. Very often, we tend to differentiate humans and machines. And in the past, we always talk about uh, AI and new technologies and replace human beings, creating social issues. And we may worry about the uh, replacement of human beings by machines. And we may have this concept of superhumans. And I think this superhuman means the integration of uh, humans and machines. I think human itself can also be integrated with softwares and technologies. We can improve our intelligence and our physical strength. So I don't think this uh, simple robot can replace human beings. Humans themselves can in enhance our capacity and become a new species. So it may seems like a f science fiction. But I've seen such companies in Silicon Valley. They are doing such applications. I think they will have enormous development in the future. And um, it's true, right? Um, humans and the need for human input, be it physical or intellectual, is obviously not mutually exclusive, right, with the development of deep tech, some of which will replace the need for some types of human input. But I think what's probably just sort of take a step back and drawing on some of my older experiences as a, as a policy person, right, in Singapore, I think government has a big role to play in all of this. And there's two parts to this. The part that a lot of people often focus on is the long-term policy direction, which is what is the right structure of the economy that can match the number of human beings we think will exist in our society and the types of jobs that will be available to them, right? Singapore went through a, you know, obviously a much smaller scale than China, but went through a transition as well, where it was largely a manufacturing-based economy that served its people well, and there was a great sort of, you know, uh, a person to job and job availability fit. Uh, over time, moving towards more services, like financial services, IT, there is now a thriving startup scene in Singapore. Once again, smaller country, easier to execute. But government has a big role to play here in, you know, incentivizing the right types of industries to grow, uh, and also incentivizing the right types of companies to set up home in Singapore, uh, which will then result in certain types of jobs being created. Now, what's often, and also obviously education, right, as everyone has talked about, education is a big part of this, right? How do we make sure that our schools, be it elementary, secondary, and tertiary institutions, are providing the necessary training uh, for those jobs to eventually be occupied? Now, the part that is less often discussed is short-term policy measures to ameliorate friction in the short term, because some of this disruption, you know, this kind of stuff, it happens over a period of time, but in the middle, you're going to have jobs being displaced, right? You're going to have some, um, you're going to have entire sort of um, workforces or teams within organizations being wiped out because of an adoption of new technology. The government has a very important role to play here as well, because retraining is something that they can do, right? Not by themselves, but in partnership with the private sector, right? Singapore has has executed many of such programs as it transitioned from a manufacturing uh, to services-based uh, economy by incentivizing companies to send you know, workers that would otherwise be out of a job for retraining so that they could rejoin the company six months later. Uh, and the government obviously would foot part of the bill right, for some of these expenses in a new type of job with a new type of job description. And I think China is uniquely positioned to lead the way in this because of the fact that it is a relatively centrally uh, uh, governed economy. Right, where government has a strong role to play. Indeed. 
It's certainly one of the most important uh, takeaways from any thought process about how to prepare a society for the wave of innovation coming is increased investment in their people in a number of respects. And uh, Professor, you spoke about, uh, uh, and you work in higher education in particular, what does this mean for the post-secondary education? I mean, this country produces an enormous number of graduates right now. Uh, do you think that the, the, the structure and the orientation of higher education needs to adapt as well? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I think um, we actually need to push computer science down into elementary school um, because I think it's, it's part of being a functioning citizen that you understand the information infrastructure and how it works um, so that you're not just a, a pawn or a victim uh, of that infrastructure. Um, but I think in, in the long run, we have to emphasize the humanistic, uh, we might call it psychological engineering, um, learning how to uh, add more value, right? So it's, it's all very well saying um, we're gonna have human to human services, but most of those services currently are, are low paid. You know, take childcare, for example. It's very low paid. There's essentially no training. We have absolutely no idea how to do it. Probably many childcare providers do more damage than good. Um, and this is partly because we've just neglected this area in the development of our science base. Um, and so if you want people to have high paid jobs, they have to have, provide a good deal of value. Uh, and they can only do uh, that if they're professionalized, if they have tools to work with that make them productive uh, and successful in these tasks. Um, so this looks very different. And it, in, the education system is one of the slowest moving uh, parts of, of society. Uh, it takes decades and decades to, uh, to implement real change uh, that has to, because it has to start you know, in first grade and go all the way through postgraduate education. It all has to fit together. Um, but uh, I think this can be done. You know, Singapore is a very interesting example. I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, that case because you know I've, I've met with some of their senior government officials and they they completely get this point um, and I, I propose to them a, a metaphor that uh, you know retraining people to be data scientists is like you know, you know that's great uh, that's sort of like having one lifeboat for a giant cruise ship yeah. um, and, uh, and their response was yes but Singapore is small enough to fit in the lifeboat <laughs> <laughs> right, which I, you know, and, and so they had already thought through this uh, and, and realized that they, you know, they were small enough that they could focus and concentrate on this area uh, and probably retain their economic vigor for, for decades. Um, but that's not an option for China. It's not an option for the United States or Europe. Um, so uh, I, I really think that the, the governments and the, um, the education sector have got together and, uh, you know, figure out um, what is the way to restructure this uh, and start now because it takes, you know, it takes decades to retool the research enterprise uh, and start producing the results that we need. You two are a product and part of the Chinese educational system. Are there other lifeboats that come to mind that uh, would be a good focus area for you know, increased emphasis in terms of training here? We've been doing, uh, but do, in doing internet industry, we have a saying that this is a happy, worried, worrisome job. So if we really grow to a certain stage, the society and the enterprises have already been better off. And at that time, I think human beings will find a way to solve this issue. So for me, Right now, what is more, most important is to solve the issues right now. The issues right now is we don't have enough technology. The 4.0 industry, the industry 4.0 age is not there yet. We still need to do more in research and development, in particular in the field of fundamental technologies. Therefore, we should worry too much about the future. We don't need to worry about the future. This is not the best option. And second, 
I think apart from labor, humans have many other assets which were not well respected. For example, data is one of them. Data in China and the United, United States were are in the hands of a number of internet giants. And these giants used users' data to achieve monopoly and huge profits in the market. But the owner of the data, whether the users, whether has been well paid, has get the returns because we don't know what kind of data has been recorded and we don't know how this data is used. I have an ant. Uh, my ant is very uh, has a lot of gossip. Um, uh, he has a lot of uh, you know uh, news like uh, how cancer can be treated, and there is also new th things going on in North Korea. So he may spread such gossip once a month, and later when AI was introduced to the news. Then, but different people have different interpretation of the news. So when I look at her uh, world and my world, I think it's totally different. So this data, rather than being used to help the humans improve their life, they're being used as weapon, as tool to maximize our weaknesses and to gain profit. In doing so, shall we get the consent of the owner of the data? Should we give return to the owner of the data? Right now, we don't have adequate laws and uh, regulations, and the definition of the owner's right is not very clear. Right now, we can use blockchain to manage people's data with conditions attached. So. Actually, we can give back to society by using the data, and we can even allow, we can even uh, ask the enterprises to use the data by paying for it. They need to pay for the data they use. So this is another issue about uh, uh, profit distribution. I'm from an internet company. I'm the criticizer of myself. I'm criticizing myself. And I think if we monopolize data usage and the development of AI and blockchain and other advanced technologies will be hampered because these are the foundations of uh, data. Without accessibility and control over data, the AI blockchain and these technologies will never develop because it's not on an equal footing. Even有技术,也没有办法去验证它的技术,没有办法去应用它的技术。我相信在创投行业,其实今天这个问题很明显。就是这个数据的垄断已经给很多的 that's the same thing for universities. In Tsinghua University, many of my friends from Tsinghua University would ask me if I would like to share my data with them. If they don't have the data, uh, they can't do uh, whatever they want to do with the um, technology. So I am now promoting that we need to give the data back to those who have the data at the first place. And I think this can be done first in China. This, it's more uh, likely to succeed topics of conversation here this <laughs> week. And it's a problem that the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, our, our global network, is very focused on uh, as well. Let me ask all of you, uh, do you think that the democratization of data in the way that you just spoke about uh, is something that can be largely solved by the market? Or do you believe that there needs to be some innovative policy to steer things in that direction? I'd like to invite all of you to take a, a shot at that question. Uh, professor, do you want to start? Um, 
Yeah, I, I think I want to make two points. One is that um, we often talk about a conflict between privacy and individual data ownership on the one hand and the growth of AI companies and the ability of machine learning algorithms to, uh, to do all kinds of useful things by having access to all this data. But there's actually no conflict um, because there is now the technological capability to run machine learning algorithms on data without ever revealing that data. So this privacy preserving or secure multi-party computation uh, technology um, has gone from being completely theoretical a decade ago to being very real. There are companies now selling this technology, using it with clients. Um, and it means that, for example, competing companies can pool their data um, without anyone ever having access to it who shouldn't have access to it. They can get the results of a running machine learning on, on all the data and they can share those results, but they're not actually sharing the data. So um, that's the first point. So there's, there really isn't a good um, commercial case for, uh, allow, for allowing companies to retain monopoly ownership of the data and we should send it back. Um, I think the second point is that uh, Anyone who's used the internet um, has probably clicked on a total of about four million pages of legalese uh, in terms of contracts that you never read, that you had to say, I agree. Um, you know, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get on a plane or, or use a credit card or, or uh, you know, look at an ad or anything else. Right? It's, it's a nightmare. Um, and, uh, and the fact is that places where we have an expectation of privacy in the physical world, for example, if I write a letter and I seal it in an envelope and I put a stamp on it and I put it in the mail, it's a federal crime for someone to read that. Uh, similarly, if I make a telephone call, if someone at AT&T is listening in on my phone call with my wife, that's a federal crime, right? If I happen to send my wife an email, there's hundreds of thousands of people around the world who can read that. Uh, email and there's nothing I can do about it unless I, you know, unless I use one of these special encrypted email, super private, you know, uh, I'm going to have to kill you if you ever re read this kind of thing. Um, so that seems to me just a, a complete failure on the part of government, right? That uh, places where there's an expectation of privacy and very severe legal uh, implications for violating that expectation simply haven't caught up uh, with the way most people are communicating with each other. Um, and then, it, okay, how do we get around the, the millions of pages, pages of legalese? I think we just have to have simple, standardized forms of interaction, just as we have with credit cards. So if, when you get a credit card, the government forces the company to reveal, to disclose standard pieces of information about the interest rate, uh, about the grace period, about the penalty for late payment. And we can do the same thing for the nature of interaction with any online corporation um, by saying, okay, this is completely private and oblivious, meaning the company has to forget that it ever had this conversation. Um, it's private, but it can be used within the corporation, so it becomes part of their, uh, so it's a shared data ownership model where they and you own the nature of the interaction that you had, or it's you know, free for all, and we're going to sell your data to kidney thieves and, uh, and anybody else who wants it. Um, and if you just have that simple, you know, red, green, yellow, and whenever you're interacting with the web, you know, the nature of that interaction is the, is the color in the bar at the top of the screen, right? Then it becomes very simple. You immediately are alerted when, in fact, what you're typing is no longer private. Um, and I don't see any way around uh, this requirement, and this is going to have to be done by government because corporations will get away with as much as they can for as long as they yeah. can. <clears throat> I'd like to invite our other panelists to comment on best, best oh. ways to democratize data. Uh, I agree very much with what the professor just said because we've been talking about data privacy. But I'm more optimistic because I see the emergence of new technologies and they can protect our data better. It is especially so in Silicon Valley. Perhaps you've heard about it. Facebook and other uh, news uh, which makes people uh, more aware of data privacy. And this force uh, forces uh, these uh, companies to pr protect and the privacy of the data. And as the professor said, um, the, the people need 
need to know that there's a risk and need to uh, solve this risk. And also, I agree with Mr. Chen, who said that this is uh, the bigger issue is data monopoly because once data is monopolized. Uh, in one big company, for example, once uh, the data is disclosed, the leak, uh, the, there's a leakage, then the damage will be huge. Uh, the uh, owner of the data uh, is all the end uh, users, so that will have an impact on all of us. That means uh, that data pr uh, protection is very, very important. In the VC community of Silicon Valley, we've been talking about this. That is, how do we change this monopoly, uh, the landscape of mo monopoly, and under this background, we need to protect and promote the growth of the startups. Uh, techno uh, techno uh, technology alone is not uh, import uh, is not um, uh, enough. It's usually is the winner takes all case, especially uh, data in your work, in your life, in your medical services. This uh, a, a lot of uh, physical um, information on in your medical care, for example, if there's a leakage, that will have a huge impact. So I think we need to increase our technology innovation but more importantly government needs to have more innovative regulations to uh, govern what we are now doing we talk about the free flow in international trade but uh, in America there is antitrust law so I think we need that kind of uh, framework in which we have limited freedom if we want to talk about the freedom of using data, then uh, at the same time, we also need to have the law to limit the use, freedom of use data, and uh, uh, enterprises also need to take care of this, and also uh, users need to have their own rights. Among the other public figures we had here, uh, and Tian Jin was the president of Estonia. And Estonia is a leading example of a country that has uh, digitized, has put a lot of uh, data in integrated databases, yeah. but also created a, quite an explicit uh, legal framework around it. Singapore, we know this because the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution has been in quite advanced discussions uh, uh, with your government about cooperation, and we know that Singapore has blazed the trail in many areas of regulation. Uh, Wafeng Te, I wonder if you have some lessons or reflections on uh, how Singapore is approaching this issue. Well. Once again, maybe, maybe not just uh, specific to Singapore, but more broadly. Um, I think, you know, we talk a lot about democratization of uh, data. We talked about how we work, uh, how we govern, how we live. I do think, though, that one thing that we haven't talked about as much, that I'd, love, I'd like to sort of engage on a little bit, is how we play, right? Because play is and will always be a part of our lives. People desire enjoyment, pleasure. You know, I'm in the live sports uh, 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 media business, uh, one championship. It's uh, uh, actually the largest uh, global sports media property in Asia, and we're a martial arts promotion. And we have live events, and we have content outside of live events, and people consume these either live or through, um, you know, digital or traditional TV channels. And this is not unlike NBA, NFL. So consuming uh, entertainment, big part of how we play. But I think a big part of the fourth industrial revolution and sort of making sure that the benefits accrue to not just a few is also to make sure that everyone has access to such enjoyment, right? Um, you know, I think Singapore is a, um, once again, it's a smallish country, and sometimes it's easy to kind of think through these things and implement very quickly. But, you know, take for example a place like um, uh, Indonesia or the Philippines, archipelagic, large, multiple islands. Um, in some of these places, you have linguistic differences, unlike in China. Um, how do we make sure that, as an entertainment company, our content can reach every single person? Right? Because we want to inspire right? the masses. We want to give them enjoyment. We want our you know, athletic heroes to be role models for kids all over, say, Indonesia, Philippines, and, and China as well. Government has a huge role to play. Right? You think about it, number one. 3G, 4G infrastructure has to exist. And look, the solution doesn't always have to be rocket science, right? Making sure that road, rail, and infrastructure exists so that people can have access to goods, be it physical or digital, is a huge part, I think, of government's role. Singapore has done, a, 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 I think, a very good job doing that. You, you go anywhere in the island, you can watch content, right? Uh, and a lot of the content today is for free because a lot of channels are for free, right? The other part, of course, is making sure that there is always a low-cost option for consuming right, some of this content. 
Xiaomi, Huawei are great examples of that, right? Allowing enterprises to, to thrive and reach a scale so that their unit cost of production goes down, therefore they can price uh, their goods at competitive rates and, goods, uh, and rates that are affordable, right, to the masses. Um, so I think, look, I think sometimes, so yes, the, I think the role of government is very important. Actually, on the data piece, I completely agree. You can't leave it to a big business and big capital to, to, to kind of self-regulate. I think government has to step in and come up with, and keep up right, with these changes. But even in terms of making sure that um, the benefits of some of the, the, the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution that includes play and enjoyment is something that is accessible to everyone. I think that's an important thing as well. Thus far, we've been focused on a couple of broad areas. One is the labor force. What's going to happen to the labor force as societies become more innovative? And then secondly, we've been looking at the democratization of data in the sense of giving people more agency, more ownership of their data. I'd like to bring up a third uh, dimension that we've heard in the discussions in some of the sessions here this week, which is um, how does the public sector, what's the responsibility and role of the public sector in better deploying big data in this regard? For example, uh, one of the hottest issues right now is in the health sector. In, in many countries, it's either the public sector or quasi-public sector that controls much of the health system and therefore sits on top of the health data. How to make that better available uh, for the type of uh, analytics and diagnosis that can help improve the quality of ordinary doctors out there. Second, we've had, for example, uh, I'll just give you another example. The chief minister of the state of Andhra Pradesh of India was here, and he was speaking earlier this morning about how his state government is taking a very, very deliberate approach of trying to figure out how to make much more data intensive the government services that are provided. And I'll give you one example of that, and that is the use of drones equipped with LIDAR a technology that surveys the quality of the very elaborate road network rurally in that developing province such that they have a real-time understanding of where the biggest problems in the road network are that require immediate. I'd, I'd like first to start with you, uh, uh, Stuart. Um, inevitably, you must be giving some thought to what's the role and responsibility of the public sector in, in maximizing the utility for societies of AI and the data that it's built off of. Uh, and, you know, I, I just be interested in your view. I think we all be interested in your view about what's going well in that regard. Are you aware of good examples? And then do you think there's, there's a larger lesson for policy going forward? Uh, I think that's a great question. It probably helps to start with the health sector, um, which I think, as you, as you point out, is an area where uh, the availability and quality of data is absolutely uh, fundamental to building AI systems that will really improve the quality of health. Um, and uh, you know, I've seen the situation in the US, the UK, and France. Um, and in fact, I, I had another life as a professor of neurosurgery uh, at uh, UC San Francisco, and I worked on intensive care medicine. Um, and uh, the situation in the US seems to be a sort of a huge nonstop market failure. Um, that uh, obtaining data is, is a nightmare, um, not just because of all the legal restrictions and HIPAA, but just because of people holding onto it uh, as a form of property. Um, and uh, it's very hard to do large-scale studies. Um, you know, we would like to, for example, collect uh, intensive care data from tens of thousands of patients in real time. And, uh, and then use that basically to keep people alive. That's, that's the goal of intensive care medicine. Um, but that's taken 15 or 20 years, uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, we've burned through many, many grad students and postdocs just trying to get through the, the administrative and financial constraints on that. Uh, in the UK, the National Health Service, of course, has you know, vast quantities of data, uh, and in France, uh, the same thing. They have a national a uh, database into which they have collected the medical records of, of 65 million uh, living and, and dis recently deceased French people. Um, and, uh, and they are starting to 
uh, analyze that uh, and produce really fundamental uh, insights into what is, you know, what is the life course uh, of people um, who end up costing the state huge quantities of money in medical care. You know, where, where do things go wrong? How early can we intervene? Um, so I think the role for the state there is, uh, is either, you know, either as the owners of the data, they have a responsibility to make the best use of it, or to try to clear up the market failures that exist in, uh, in systems like the US, which is very balkanized um, and uh, very litigated. Um, more broadly, mm. I think that um, the data that are collected eventually is going to facilitate um, the construction of accurate micro models of your entire economy. So in principle, we can, we can track every uh, transaction, every movement of a person, you know, so satellites uh, can see where everybody is and where all the cars are going, uh, you know, drones, as you said, for the state of road. So we can build incredibly detailed models uh, and not just what is the current state of my country, but what is the dynamics by which it evolves. Um, and you know, this is the econometrician's dream, uh, and it can, be, it can come true. Uh, and with those kinds of models, you can really start to look at uh, the implications of different policies over the medium and long term. And you can actually uh, have evidence-based <coughs> government. You know, so there's this funny phrase, evidence-based medicine. It's like, really? What were you doing before? Um, but you could have... A, a, you could have evidence-based government. Um, and uh, you know, in, in some sense, this is, uh, this is what governments should be doing, right? That right. I think there's a, there's a view that um, you know, the government is a group of people who get to exert power, uh, and then somehow we put checks and balances on them to make it not too bad. But actually, government is, should be just a function. It happens to have people in it who make it yeah. run. But it should be just a function to make life better for the, the people in the, uh, in the country that it's governing. Um, and so to the extent that we can move government towards uh, a kind of rational decision-making model, uh, we are still the, the owners of the preferences that this rational decision-making model is supposed to be optimizing. Uh, and that's why we vote, uh, is to express preferences, uh, which the government is then supposed to uh, implement through rational decision making, um, but if we can, you know, if, if we can give governments machinery to actually make that a reality, I think this could be fantastic. So, so that draws very closely to the theme of this summit, would, uh, or this session, I should say, which is not shaping an innovative economy. This is shaping innovative societies. And so, we're, your point about what are what are the roles and responsibilities of governments in trying to improve the ecosystem by which data is deployed for the benefit of society, for public services, for well-being, if you will, is a really important third area, I think, of inquiry here. And I'd just like to invite uh, our other colleagues to reflect uh, about their own countries in this regard. Where do you see the priorities for trying to have a bit more of an intention on the part of government to create that type of public benefit from data and analytics? What's your example? I can give you one example. Fujian province in southern China uh, in 2001 proposed the concept or strategy of digital Fujian. And they've been moving towards that strategy. In recent two years, a lot of the health data has been collected. A lot of Chinese hospitals are uh, government-owned, and this data in Fujian province are highly concentrated. In their practice, how do we leverage this data? This is a big question for the local government. And I think it's more about legislation, policy, and rights and interest. So after this data is collected, how do we make full use of it? Do we allow commercial institutions to use the data 
and provide service to the user, or it should be the government that use the data to offer the service. And the owner of the data and the owner of the technology are separated right now. I want to come back to my point. I believe the core issue is to, to give back data to the user and also the custody the data need to be changed. And you need to prove that the custody need to get consent from the data, uh, c consent from the public. So without consent from the public, the custody or the guardian of the data cannot have access to it. So we need to ensure that whether it's a government or a commercial institutions or guardians of the data need to get consent from the public first. I remember President Lincoln in the United States about over 100 years ago mentioned that government of the people, by the people, for the people. I think he refers to a world of a physical world as opposed to the virtual world. But now in our virtual world, I think we need to emphasize the data of the people, for the people, by the people. This is my point. An excellent way to think about uh, the issue. Would any of our other panels care to comment about the agenda for better public efforts to utilize artificial intelligence and, and data? Uh, I quite agree with the point. The, own, the, uh, the owner of this uh, data need to be better uh, defined, and we need to make better use of the data. We need to promote the integration of medical care with AI. In the United States, AI has become a new trend in, uh, in the medical care sector. Whenever a new technology emerges, we see that medical care uh, can best make full use of the AI. Of course, we talk about the ownership of the data and everything. And, but in the meantime, we have massive amount of data. The government may have a lot of data, and so does inst so do institutions. But how do we uh, get insight from this data and get the benefit? Then these new technologies can help us to do targeted uh, diagnosis of diseases, also targeted treatment for the patients. And in case of cancer treatment, we can also. Uh, offer such targeted treatment. So it needs to be personalized, and such personalization requires a continuous information from the, from the users. And this information may include their medical data and all the biometrics data. And at the macro level, I'm very optimistic we have entered into an era where we have a lot of uh, low-cost sensors. And we can capture these data, these biometrics data. So whether we can concentrate this data in one certain place. We used to study a lot of the medical data. But now we can study the biometrics. So this uh, information can help us to uh, develop the health policy and to make predictions of the demographic changes. And we might also produce a report out of this data to provide evidence and support to the organizations. I think this will become a very good combination of micro and macro data. This whole discussion, one term that comes to mind is social compact. Right? I feel like, I mean, let's, let's reflect, World Economic Forum right, committed to improving the state of the world. Given the advances in data science, I think um, it is actually imperative right, for government uh, to harness the power uh, of that to improve the lives of its citizens. Now, will we have some privacy trade-offs in the, in the process? Probably. But you know, give and take between citizenry and government is not a new thing. Right? There are social compacts that exist in high-tax countries, for instance, in Nordic states, right? where tax rates are extremely high, but because of high quality of public service, you know, free education, um, so not just price but quality as well, people accept it. Right? And that is a social compact. 
Some people have called Singapore a, benevol a benevolent dictatorship. You know, I personally don't agree with that term, but to the extent there is some logic or perceived logic to that term, so what? It's a, it's a social compact, right? Uh, you run the country tightly, uh, you run the country rigorously, but people are happy, things work. Those of you that have been to Singapore know what I mean. So be it. This is a new, I, I think we are entering an age of a new social compact when it comes to data privacy. In order to, um, in order to see improvement in public services, healthcare is a big, a big part, but other services as well, transport, education, I think people will have to allow governments uh, to monitor and track data. And this is not just self-reported data. This is where you, where you surf, where you log on, where you log out, where you drive. If, you, if you've been to Singapore, you will see cameras <laughs> you know, all around the island. But look, if, if it makes life better, if it makes healthcare better, if it makes transport better, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, the Singapore government, uh, this was like, I think, one, two years ago, uh, replaced physical parking coupons. So those of you that have been to Singapore and parked in public parking lots, of which there are many, would have had to use uh, a physical coupon that you sort of, it's like a punch card. You punch it and you put it you know, on, the, on the sort of uh, windshield and the parking attendant sees it, you paid your thing, and they go off. They've replaced all of that now with an app, right? So when I stop my car, I, I, uh, I basically log on, I say I'm here, and when I leave, I log off, right? So it knows precisely how long I have parked and where I went, right? Now, is that, uh, uh, is that a give in terms of my privacy? Yes. But does it make for a general better parking experience? Of course. I don't just scramble anymore for, the, for my paper uh, a parking coupon, right? So I think, I think the, 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 the term social compact comes to mind, and I think that we're entering an age where this social compact will have to be crafted in each of the countries that, that desires to improve the state of its, uh, its, its uh, citizens. I think that's a terrific note on which to end this uh, session. Uh, and if I could paraphrase from what you're saying is that uh, societies to be able to succeed in being innovative but also achieve that human-centric element that ultimately they're judged on by their people will require some degree of updating and upgrading their social contracts. And we've spoken about three dimensions of that with respect to the workforce and the transitional effects, with respect to the ownership uh, of data itself, and with respect to government's role and responsibility in helping to deploy some of these fourth industrial revolution tools, notably artificial intelligence and machine learning, to big public challenges that improve people's quality of life. So that is uh, indeed uh, at the heart of the philosophy uh, of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The, the effort that we're doing, and we're so pleased to open here, uh, to announce this week that we'll be opening in China a center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's intended to be a platform for the dialogue among the public and private sectors and the technical and academic and civil society communities about exactly what you've just mentioned. What are the steps that need to be taken in policymaking that would make for the kind of social understanding that would maximize societal benefits of this technology and mitigate the risks? So would you please join me in thanking and appreciating our terrific panel here today. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite the uh, panelists to join me walking off the stage, but I would ask that you all stay in your seats. It'll just be a couple of minutes till we change over to our closing uh, remarks by our, the forum's president, Borga Brenda, the vice mayor of Dalian, as well as the mayor of our host city here, Tianjin. Thanks. Please be patient. <laughs>